The slower pathway goes from the visual thalamus down to the visual cortex and actually to the hippocampus and then to the amygdala. And that's where these, uh, the learning, if you will, or the memory of this particular event gets formed and that trace gets formed in probably in the hippocampus uh, and into the amygdala and then is stored in the hippocampus uh, as a fear memory. Now the other important part of this uh, diagram is that the downstream effects from the amygdala are to things like blood pressure and uh, muscle tone, muscle pressure, muscle uh, muscle tone. And why is that? Well, so in the in this sort of description of how one deals with threat, uh, you can think about the old fight or flight um, kind of dichotomy with the amygdala playing a role in terms of threat detection. The body has to prepare itself to deal with threat. And so there are changes in autonomic activity, uh, both sympathetic and parasympathetic, as well as changes in stress hormones and cortisol and so forth and so on. Okay? Now, um, what accounts for, um, uh, uh, can we in fact see these changes in attention to novelty? Oh, and I should say something else, by the way. Um, the, uh, there's a debate in the neuroscience literature as to whether or not the amygdala is sensitive to threat, so to things like snakes or pictures of angry faces, or to novelty in general. All right, and the, the going uh, uh, opinion now is that really it's more of a novelty detector as opposed to simply a threat detector. Um, and there are a number of studies that have uh, looked at changes in the uh, novelty or unfamiliarity of a stimulus without the stimulus being necessarily threatening that have shown heightened amygdala activation as a function of exposure to that. So. Um, as I mentioned, we were very interested in looking at this, uh, the uh, changes in uh, infants or attention in infants to threat or to novelty. Uh, and I, as I said to you, we, this is how we did our four-month assessment. Um, but at nine months of age, we brought all of these infants in um, and we put these little caps on them. Um, that allow us to uh, assess their brain electrical activity. And we presented them with a series of tones, auditory uh, stimuli. Um, 228 of them were of one particular frequency, uh, 36 were of a deviant frequency, and we also presented them with 36 complex novel stimuli. The reason that we did this is we uh, were hoping to elicit what's called in the attention literature a mismatch negativity. And basically, the thing to understand about this is that we wanted to see whether or not the infants would detect the difference, the very subtle difference, if you will, between a 950 hertz tone and a 1000 hertz tone. Um, using this ERP called the mismatch negativity. We also wanted to see whether or not the infants would show a uh, detection of these very novel stimuli, these complex novel stimuli, and those stimuli were things like a door slamming or a uh, dog barking. So they were extremely novel as opposed to the very subtle novelty that you have in the mismatch negativity. So here's our um, uh, the data that we have from this nine-month assessment. And really the, the bar graphs that I want you to uh, focus on are the ones in the center. Those are those high negative, high motor reactive infants who we believe are going to go on to show behavioral inhibition. In fact, we've shown that in fact they do. Here they are at nine months of age. And if you look at the difference in the amplitude of the signal between the deviant and the standard, what you can see there is that compared to a control group and infants who were, we also selected for being more positive in terms of their reactivity, they're showing extremely, uh, a significantly heightened ERP amplitude to the deviant compared to the standard. 
all right? So at nine months of age, based upon our assessment of them at four months of age, that's five months earlier, based upon their reactivity to novelty, here they are five months later, we put them into this very benign uh, ERP uh, task, and they are showing differences in their response to novelty already at nine months of age, all right? Um, but there's a difference in their response to novelty versus our high positive and control group when it comes to very complex novelty. Um, and I, I think that the colors actually didn't come out exactly correct, but the highest amplitude peak there is for the high positive kids. It should be blue. The control group is green and should be green. And the high negative infants, those are the ones who are the lowest ones at the bottom there. So when it comes to extreme levels of novelty, the high negative infants are actually not showing the greatest discrimination. The high positive ones are. When it comes to very subtle differences in novelty, particularly in the auditory novelty environment, the high negative infants are showing greater discrimination of very subtle differences in novelty compared to either the high positive or, or the control group. Already at nine months of age, based upon this four month uh, assessment of their, uh, of their temperament. And this just sort of basically shows um, what that looks like in terms of where the amplitude of the, of the signal was uh, over, spread over the cortex. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that we were interested in this novelty I mentioned to you earlier is Ledoux's model of uh, the centrality of the amygdala as being a, an important brain structure that is associated with um, uh, threat detection or novelty detection. And uh, Jerry Kagan and we have uh, written that uh, it may in fact be that these behaviorally inhibited uh, infants and young children that the underlying biological difference that they start life out uh, with may in fact be uh, differences in reactivity of the amygdala to threatening or novel stimuli. And in fact, there's some reason to believe in those ERPs that I just showed you that that first mismatch negativity, that those subtle differences in novelty may in fact be uh, amygdala driven. But uh, we wanted to assess uh, the amygdala more directly and that's a very difficult thing to do since it's a structure that's deep in the brain. Um, and you really can't do that uh, accurately with ERP. So we really had to wait until our subjects were older and we can use a, a functioning, functional uh, neuroimaging uh, approach. Um, and we did that uh, study uh, in collaboration with Danny Pine at uh, the NIH. These are again the same sample of behaviorally inhibited children who we identified at four months of age and have seen prospectively forward. We used a face task. Um, the subjects were in the scanner and they saw fear faces, happy faces, angry faces, and neutral faces. And for each face, they had to rate how hostile the face was, how afraid they were of that particular face, how wide the nose, or just look at the face. The reason we asked them these questions is that we were interested in making sure that they were looking at the face. And we also wanted to control the attentional state of the subject while they were in the scanner. So for example, um, when we were comparing their response to a fear face, we could, uh, we could look at the brain response when they said, when they were asked how afraid you are of that face, in which case we were getting attention towards their own internal state, versus their passive viewing of this uh, emotion expression. And the way functional neuroimaging works is you take two events and you contrast them. You basically subtract the brain activity in one from the brain activity of the other. So it's called an event-related subtraction paradigm. So what we're doing here is we're subtracting the brain activity during the passive viewing from the brain activity when they are looking at the same face but are asked, how afraid are you of that face? And we're comparing our behaviorally inhibited subjects to non-inhibited subjects. 